I grew up in a decent neighborhood when I was a kid, you know, not super rich, but we lived in a nice neighborhood. I said, if you asked me to, to name five awesome things that happened, and I, I mentioned the address of where I grew up mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I'd have to really think about it. Right. Like, you know, what, what five awesome things have happened in this house that we've lived in for 10 years? Mm. Our son was born. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's you know, we've had some saying. pretty epic, you know, dinner parties. But I have to think about it. Now, imagine asking the question, name five awesome things that have happened during our adventure travel. I, I could be here all day. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so, you know, how fulfilling is this house, really? I can't even name three or four things cool that happened in my house. I can't name three or four things cool that happened in my house growing up. Yeah. You know, but I mean, <laughs> what happened? I mean, pick a date that we were traveling on adventure travel overseas. And, you know, if I pull up the pictures from that date, I'd be like, oh, this was great. And this, this, we knocked this item off our bucket list. You know, I, the last trip we took, just Emily and I, where we left the kids with the grandparents, we, we, I think we knocked something off our bucket list every day for 30 days straight. At least one thing. Wow, oh, cool. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's what it's all about. And so, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that speaks for itself. Well, yeah. even when the trip that we took the children on, we oh, yeah. knocked off Last some things week. off the bucket list. And the, oh, even the yeah. kids, it was their bucket list items as well. I know. I had to wait till I was in my almost 50 years old to do some of these things. And they're four and eight, and they get to do it. <laughs> you know? I, had to wait, I had to wait till I was 49 years old to ride in a hot air balloon. This is Episode 7 of the Own Stream Podcast, featuring Scott and Emily McKay. Welcome to the Own Stream Podcast. We're so happy you're with us this week. I'm Teresa Scoba. And I'm Stephen Shelley. We're delighted you're with us. And we're featuring our conversation with Scott and Emily McKay this week. And uh, Scott and I, I think this is a perfect way to kind of introduce the conversation. Scott and I have known each other for about 10 years. And uh, he's a dating coach. I used to be a dating coach. And... I can't remember how we met each other, but uh, we became connected, and for many years in the dating world, he would release a product, and I would promote it. I would release a product, and he would promote it back and forth. We've always had a really great um, business relationship, and what I find interesting about it, which I think is very relevant to our topic, is that we've never actually met in person. Yeah, that's amazing. And so uh, what this is like is when you have an online business, you, you create a network of affiliates who are in the same space usually, space meaning niche or, or business type. And in our case, it was men's dating advice. And uh, so we, um, we would promote each other's things. And we've never met each other in person. We've talked many times on the phone, um, been interviewed for various podcasts. Uh, so anyway, I think that's an interesting wrinkle for people who are maybe learning about online businesses and digital nomads, um, that you create these relationships, but you may never have actually met the person uh, physically. So we talk about that a little bit in the in the podcast. So when we launched OwnStream, right around that time, I showed you a picture yeah. On it, Facebook. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of perfect. It was one of those moments of synchronicity because we were thinking about the types of people we wanted to feature and the things we're interested in. And then we saw a picture of Scott and Emily with their four month old in front of the Taj Mahal <laughs> in Agra, India. And we have we went to India two two a little over two years ago. And for us, two people very, very, um, without child at that point. Um, you know, it was a struggle to get to the Taj Mahal. We had, we had like, uh, you know, it was just it, our time in India was, was marvelous, but we, that was toward the beginning of our trip. And anyway, it was a challenge. So we knew what they had to go through, um, to get a, a four month old there, what it might've been like, what it smelled like, what they, everything, everything all the people that would have been surrounding them. It was very impressive. I have to say, I looked at it, and my first question to Scott on the on the comment thread was, "How old was your baby at this moment?" He wrote back four months, and our daughter was probably six, seven months at the time. And 
I was I had mad respect for those two for that. That <laughs> was impressive. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of talk in this conversation about experiences traveling, in particular traveling with kids and family, younger kids being digital nomads. So they're not full-time digital nomads. They spend uh, some of the year their home in Texas and then other parts of the year they're traveling. Some great stories in here though of Scott doing like client work in the middle of Ethiopia. Really, really interesting stuff. Just, just I, th- to me, they, they, what shines through in this conversation is their spirit of adventure and how they really nourish each other's excitement about uh, adventure and travel, and how they've been really willing to take their kids along for the ride. And how it, it you know, I, it didn't have to stop because they had children. Yeah. You know, they, they, they had this moment which they'll talk about where they, you know, they had loved to travel as a couple. They had built this business together, and then they had just stopped traveling when they had kids, and they just thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to settle down and your kids are in school. And then they thought, well, why does it have to be like that? And they questioned it, you know, and now they they have beautiful stories of educating their kids on the road and what their children know about other people and other ways of living and other foods, you know, like really just marvelous stories of what you can learn when you're actually in a place um, versus learning it out of a book. And as you probably picked up in that opening quote, uh, their kids have bucket lists, which I think is pretty awesome. awesome. <laughs> like what kids in this world have a bucket list already? Anyway, their kids have bucket lists and they're marking stuff off of their bucket list. So more power to them. A lot of really, really cool stuff in this conversation. And the the fun of their relationship really shines through. Scott says at the end, you know, a, a really great relationship isn't work. And I love that. Mm. Our relationship isn't work. Mm, it's not like yeah. we're like working at this. No, it's no. not that way at all. We, there's something really, really strong between us. And you'll pick up on that between Scott and Emily as well. And by the way, their business, they still do dating coaching, the two of them. Uh, they work together, although I think she speaks to the women and I think he, he deals with men. But the, the name of their business is X and Y Communications. And at the beginning of our conversation, we refer to that. So just so you're clear. X and Y Communications is their dating coaching business that they run together. Um, All right. I think that's it. Um, We'll be back afterwards to wrap up. Until then, enjoy this terrific interview with Scott and Emily McKay. So maybe you guys can just tell us a little bit about how X and Y Communications got started. And Scott, maybe you can start by talking a little bit about that pre-Emily and then, you know, what happened when you guys got together. Well, interestingly enough, I had uh, been dating these women who were amazing by the standards of most of my friends. And they said to me, you know, if a guy like you is dating those kind of women, I think you better write a book or something or at least (laughs) – all right. You better tell us how you're doing it. And that started me thinking about, hey, you know, what could I do to give back here and help some other guys meet some great women? Because it really was worth it to improve my skills with relating to women and, and being the kind of guy a woman would want. So I started a newsletter. And my first newsletter was to about 16 or 17 people I knew. And that was on the 4th of December of 2005. And interestingly enough, you know, I was writing all these interesting stories, mostly to women, by the way. Um, my first newsletter ever, my first writings for X and Y Communications were on pet names, the language of pet names. But what really, what really warmed my heart was to help guys meet the women of their dreams. Mm. And interestingly enough, on the 11th of February of 2006, I don't, you can count the days, it's two months. Okay. Mm. I meet Emily. (laughs) So next thing you know, I met the woman of my dreams. And the next thing you know, the word podcasting was something I'd heard bandied about a little bit. And I said to Emily, I said, you know, it would be fun if you and I kind of uh, did a podcast together. And then the X and Y on the fly show of which uh, you two are going to be a guest on here really shortly uh, came from that. And we're still doing it. And uh, you know, 60,000 people on the mailing list later and 150,000 Twitter followers between us later, we're still as passionate about helping other people find love as ever. Sweet. And Emily, you know, I don't think I've ever, you and I have never spoken, but what were you doing when you stumbled across Scott? 
Well, I was busy dating and having fun online. It was like being a kid in a candy store. Uh-huh. Um, I had uh, I was a single mom, of course, uh, raising my son and uh, having a full time job in the medical supply industry. So I was I was having a pretty good life, and I was really wanting to find uh, the guy of my dreams. And so I set out on a mission to do so, and I found Scott in under thirty days. Man, I must have been like the Reese's peanut butter cup of the candy store. This <laughs> <laughs> one of all, of course. Or is it Godiva? Yeah, Something Godiva's like is better. Some people have peanut allergies, so let's be clear. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should change my name to Russell Stover. That would fit your persona a little bit. <laughs> well, so you guys got together and fairly soon after got married. Is that right? Like half a year or so? Am I remembering that correctly? It was nine months to the day, and then our son was born the day after. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually damn close to nine months. Uh-huh. Right. You know, I never even put two and two together there in that regard, but... You know, we were married December 9th, having met on February 11th. Right. And but, getting engaged in September. Right. But there was no baby the bump. Yeah. There was never a baby bump. So, right, you know, right. It's all, you know, it's on the up and up. It's on the up and up. But um, we actually uh, met and broke all the rules. I mean, we started seeing each other every waking hour we weren't working. Uh, she called me 10 minutes after our first date, which, of course, is rule number one not to break. <laughs> right. And, you know, we just knew. I mean, I canceled my Valentine's date to go out with you twice. three days later. <laughs> well, twice. Oh. You went lunch and dinner. You know, it's funny because I had three women in my life who I was trying to figure out which one to marry, and they all would have been a wonderful choice. Even in retrospect, I could probably have been happily married to any of them. And I was like sort of hoping when I met Emily, you know, this is going to really make things complicated if she shows up and, and is anything, anyone close to who I think she's going to be. So it would kind of be better if, you know, she disappointed me because then I could just, you know, right. have said, all right, look, I tried to raise I tried to raise the bar one more time. Didn't happen. I'm good. And, you know, so talk about not being needy and clingy and desperate on a first date. I'm hoping it doesn't work. And then she shows up through the doorway of the IHOP at eight o'clock in the morning and I just roll my eyes and go, all right, I'm in trouble. Yeah, it's over. game <laughs> over. And then she gives me this cute little voice and this sweet little smile. And she's as, as sweet and friendly and level headed and, and virtuous as she is adorable. You know, she looks like a head-on collision between every dream girl I've ever imagined in my mind. Oh, and now you know why I like him so much. <laughs> it was that head-on collision. Yeah, right, knocked right. Knocked some sense in. <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> knocked him off his feet. All of the above. And so, you know, that's how it worked. And we spent so much time together. And, you know, it was so... It was... It was a, everybody thought we were very cute together. We were. We are. And I love her more now than when I met her. I mean, I've never once ever in my entire 11 years of knowing this woman ever looked back and said, you know, maybe I made a mistake. It's just, it's never even occurred to me. So, you know, I, what I did was I put her through a little bit of hell. I took her to a couple uh, road trips, like four or five days straight of windshield time just to kind of pass this thing through the fire and see if it still survives. You call that hell? I thought that was fun. <laughs> It was rather heavenly at times. You have a lot of windshield time, that's for sure. If you want to put it to the test, that puts it to the test. Right. And a lot of perturbed hotel neighbors at breakfast the next morning. <laughs> and where did oh, you guys God. go? Were well, these were like road trips here in Texas? You just hit the road. Where where were some of these trips? To? And was your first date really at an IHOP? <laughs> yes, it really was. I love breakfast, and so we decided we'll just meet there since that was Sweet. my favorite love meal it. of the day. <laughs> so it starts off on a good foot, and you know, breakfast starts off your day, right? That's right. Yeah. Actually, uh, we're kind of hopping around, eye hopping around. There you go. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes we take when people come here for uh, for in field coaching for the weekend. Usually, we have like a, a, a breakfast late at night after the bars close. That uh, where we kind of you know dissect everything that happened. Usually, it's an afterglow, and we'll often go to that very eye hop and sit in the very booth that we met at, and we'll drop that news on the guy or gal we're coaching while we're doing it. And they always nice. think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is yeah. cool. Yeah. But uh, the windshield time was yeah. went very well. We, yeah, well. Yeah, we went to we went to Arizona. Yeah. Had a great time, drove up to the Grand Canyon and yeah. on around Flagstaff. And uh, like I said, we rented a car and just mm-hmm. drove and drove and just had a great time talking and laughing and sometimes just sitting in silence. And then I took the poor girl again on another road trip like that from L.A. up to the 
ferry and back through the wine country and stuff. And she thought for sure I was going to propose to her. Oh, yes, because that was my birthday month. Yeah, but no, as John Belushi would say, I had to wait another <laughs> month just waiting. to make sure. So, I thought I mean, my birthday present was a ring. <laughs> <laughs> ring on the telephone. Um, <laughs> no, but I, actually, I, I proposed to her on the podcast. It was wow. kind of cute. That's yeah, right. We, we that's, have it. That's kind of like the uh, the people who propose at the baseball games. Something like that. And That's we actually cool. we actually podcasted our wedding, too. You remember that? Oh, <laughs> man. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when we podcasted our wedding together? Yes, I was there. I, I remember that perfectly. I was I too drunk? <laughs> <laughs> I was too drunk. That's another story we're not going to get into. So it seems like you guys have really taken what obviously you're passionate about and what you love, which is each other, your relationship, the magic of that, and turned it into a passionate business for yourselves, right? Can you talk a little bit more about about that and what you do? Well, we found that a lot of people settle for each other and there's a lot of couples not happy together. And besides the fact that there's a lot of people who are single looking. So you kind of put the both together. You have these single people looking for the wrong person in their life. And a lot of times they end up with the wrong person. And life's too short to be miserable, to be stuck with somebody for 30 years. And that's the end of that. And so we are very passionate to help people find what we have found together. And it's funny because a lot of people, unfortunately, don't believe that such a blissful relationship exists. You know, you just said something extremely profound. Did you mean to say that? A lot of people are looking for the wrong relationship. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I think they're almost looking for something that they know is going to fail. Yeah. Well, if they don't believe the real thing exists, why bother? Right. You know, I mean, I, I what it's like the whole idea of you don't marry who you want. You marry who you think you deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody yeah. who looks good on paper or not even you know, <laughs> someone who you think isn't going to leave you. Right. So either you go for chemistry and forget about what makes sense or you go for what makes sense and forget the heart and realize that is also important, too. And a lot of people don't think that the two actually can coexist. Yeah, I think one thing I've, I've seen uh, and I'm sure. Uh, it's you know it sounds like your your business is built on this in many ways, but deserving what you want implies a kind of worthiness, and um, so many people struggle with that, um, and and calling it that is is really powerful, because um, I think for a long time I for example wanted something but didn't feel kind of I wasn't conscious to the fact that I didn't feel that I was worthy of that, and it wasn't until that that kind of got worked out that I met Teresa. So it's really powerful. Yeah, I agree with you. And it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy um, out in the world where you will find something that will, that will not work. Um, and I think that's uh, actually, it, I think on the backside of a few of those, um, it helped me to wake up to what was actually going on inside of me and, and make a change. Um, did so you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, so I think that's something we're really interested in generally. I was thinking when you said that, that that's similar to how people see limited choices, small have a small vision for their life in general. And you guys talk about this a little bit on your on your website about um, about travel and your and your adventures with travel. And um, I, you know, just curious about how, you know. We think when one thing OwnStream is really interested in is, is the many choices we have, the infinite, abundant choices that we have and how we tend to look through such a narrow, to see a narrow vision of our life and then live a narrow vision of our life because mm. that's what we saw. And so that's, I hear that in your, you know, your description of love and in a relationship. And I, I think that's carried over to other areas of the way you live your life, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. Well, deserving what you want, what makes it so wonderful is a lot of people go through life thinking things just happen to you. You can't help anything. Whatever's right. going to happen, whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. Right. And that's kind of sad because we take it from a point of you deserve what you want, which means you have power. Mm. You have the options to learn, fix what's wrong, whether it be your choices or it be some sort of little flaw within yourself. Whatever it is, you can fix it, which gives you power. And power is wonderful because it opens up doors to, like you said, infinite possibilities infinite options. You know, finding Scott has been wonderful. Finding this wonderful life that we have with all the different choices of traveling and staying and, you know, how many kids we want. It's wonderful to have that kind of power in life. Well, I think on the deserve what you want front, <clears throat> it, it flies in the face of conventional wisdom for modern dating advice because 
I think when you look at mainstream dating advice for both men and women, it tells people what their itching ears want to hear, not what they need to hear. In other words, you already deserve this. Here's how to make this other person be your boyfriend or girlfriend. Here's how to make her have sex with you. Here's how to get him to commit. When reality is we need to be as attractive to the person we want to attract as they are to us. And that's why deserving what you want is so radical. You, you touched on freedom is what you just touched on. And, you know, I just had a really deep conversation about that with someone else. And I, I love that subject because I don't think a whole lot of people, even in our Western world, United States, Canada, Britain, Europe, I don't even think we're as free as we think we are. I mean, we can only take so much vacation or else the boss will replace us with someone else. We need to go sit in our cubicle. We need to make money for someone else. Then we come home and we have a myriad of choices in this world. And what do we do? We watch everything else happen on TV instead. Right. And that's not really being free. And then we get all leveraged with car payments and credit card bills. And next thing you know, we owe our soul to the company store. Mm. And I just think there's an alternate way to look at it. And, you know, that's, hey, you know, there's a whole world out there. I don't have to have a mortgage. I don't have to have car payments. I don't have to outdo the neighbors. I don't even have to work in a cubicle. I can go do something else if I just have the guts to go see what's out there. And uh, that's a, a lot of what we've done. And I'll be honest with you, most of our acquaintances and even our own family members think we're stark raving nuts. Right. Oh, some of them wish they had our lifestyle. Well, and that's the other thing. Yet they always ask us how it's going and they always right. want to hear the stories. I'm sure there's a little envy under their judgment. It's strange. It's kind of a strange juxtaposition of mindsets. And it's, it's a strange juxtaposition of mindsets I'm really glad I get to avoid in this life. Right. Now, I, I like to not live in a cubicle. And or be I, in a parking lot sitting for an hour or two just trying to get to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and go out and actually do and see the things that a lot of us have watched on TV. You know, we're huge fans of watching it on TV, but we're taking <laughs> notes, you know. Right, 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 right. Us too. I think I owe Michael Palin, uh, Anthony Bourdain, and, and Michael Wood, like, some kind of royalty payment. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Bonus points. Well, on your website, you, you highlight two big words that I want to kind of get you to, to unpack even more. You started to a minute ago, and I want to really drill down on those. But those are adventure and freedom. And you tie them together really nicely. And I'd like you to both kind of address those and talk about, first of all, what those mean to you. And then sort of what is this system that seems to be in place that, that pulls us away from that, this vortex of work and debt and, and responsibility, quote unquote, and, and the belief that this is just how the way things are. And, con you know, contrasted with this adventure and freedom that you guys are really dynamically pursuing. You know, that's a really great question. And when we're born and we're when we're growing up, we're told what we want. You know, there's what's called the American dream or whatever, you know, whatever dream is that you are told you're supposed to want in life. You know, you have a house, you have two cars, you have two kids or three kids, however the number is nowadays. And you're supposed <laughs> to work, retire by the time you're 60 and, you know, let 60. it go. That's nice. <laughs> Sorry, that's, 65 that's or 80, optimistic. right? Yeah. And that's the end of life. And that's kind of boring, you know, that's it. You know, shouldn't life be fun? And so... Really, success, at least in our opinion, isn't about, okay, trying to acquire as much as you can or mm -hmm. trying to get, you know, a prestigious job. It's people haven't stopped to think, what is it that will give my soul joy? And I think a lot of people haven't thought this through because we have so many people on antidepressants. They're not happy. They're being successful in, a, in, the, in the work world. On paper. On paper. But they're lacking something. They are not doing anything meaningful that brings joy to their soul. Because they haven't stopped to think, what is it I can do in life that will bring me happy, happiness, and will make my family happy? And it may be contrary to what everybody else wants from us. Just this morning, Emily and I were talking about the whole idea of having a house and uh, having stability, you know living in suburbia versus going out and living in the, on the edge and traveling and maybe even being a, a fully nomadic family. And I said, you know, 
and, and you know, let me preface this by saying I grew up in a decent neighborhood when I was a kid, you know, not super rich, but we lived in a nice neighborhood. I said, if you ask me to, to name five awesome things that happened, and I, I mentioned the address of where I grew up mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I'd have to really think about it. Right. Like, you know, what, what five awesome things have happened in this house that we've lived in for 10 years? Mm. Our son was born. That's pretty cool. You know, <laughs> we've had some saying. pretty epic, you know, dinner parties. But I have to think about it. Now, imagine asking the question, name five awesome things that have happened during our adventure travel. I, I could be here all day. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, so, you know, how fulfilling is this house, really? I can't even name three or four things cool that happened in my house. I can't name three or four things cool that happened in my house growing up. Yeah. You know, but I mean, (laughs) what happened? I mean, pick a date that we were traveling on adventure travel overseas. And, you know, if I pull up the pictures from that date, I'd be like, oh, this was great. And this, this, we knocked this item off our bucket list. You know, the last trip we took. Just Emily and I, where we mm-hmm. left the kids with the grandparents, we we I think we knocked something off our bucket list every day for thirty days straight, at least one thing. Wow, oh, cool! It was yeah. awesome. Oh yeah, I mean, and that's what it's all about. And so, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that speaks for itself. Well, yeah. even when the trip that we took the children on, we oh, yeah. knocked the off some things one. off the bucket list, and the, oh, even the that. kids, it was their bucket list items as well i know i had to wait till i was in my almost 50 years old to do some of these things and they're four and eight and they get to do it <laughs> you know? i had to wait i had to wait till i was 49 years old to ride in a hot air balloon well by the way my mother is in the other room and she's looking after our daughter right now while we talk to you guys and she often talks about a trip that my dad and she took when i was one across the country and back i was we lived in north carolina at the time And we spent, I think it was six hours at the Grand Canyon because my dad was determined for me to be physically in these locations at the age of one, even though I have no memory of them. That's how determined (laughs) he was to get me moving and traveling, and it's stuck ever since. You know, one one thing I think a lot of people think, uh, one one thing that comes up when they hear adventure travel kids and and, and you too as, as working adults is how do you set up your life to do this? And I think this is an opportunity to kind of talk to people about online businesses, being digital nomads, if you will, though that there's a lot of ways you can describe being a digital nomad. But just speak to having your online business and the freedom it affords you. Tell you, I'm glad we're living in this day and age. I mean, the Internet has really opened up opportunities that never existed in our lifetime or I mean, actually the lifetime of people before us, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, you know, if they wanted a job, they either had to be outdoor salesmen or they had to work in a cubicle. And today, the office is the computer. So if your computer can travel with you, you could be anywhere as long as you have internet access. And that's a great freedom. You can sell product, you can sell infomercial, com- pro- you can sell product, you can sell infomercial information. Information is limitless and it's wonderful to have an understanding of all kinds of things, whether it be weight loss, dating, travel. It's great Mm. to be able to access this information. And if you're one of the fortunate people to build a business, there's a lot of people who need a product and it's great to be able to be the person to provide it and travel and uh, to build the business that way. You know, I personally get a kick on out of you know being like on Charlie time somewhere in the Middle East. <laughs> and it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm right. coaching people in New York and it's seven thirty at night and it's just not even mentioning it, you know. Just being completely transparent. Right. It's, right. You know, it's cool. <laughs> I, one time one time the cat had to come out of the bag though, because I was sitting in um Lalibella, Ethiopia <laughs> at three thirty in the morning, overlooking, you know, like this gorgeous valley, you know, and there's some lights on outside and I could hear like night birds in the distance and stuff. And all of a sudden, as it does in East Africa, it started raining. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, it's raining. I got to, like, pick the thing inside. I don't. And it's funny because the, the, the Wi-Fi was not the best. So I had, like, finagled it. So I had this great, you know. And I had to finally, I had to finally tell the guy, I said, look, I'm in Ethiopia. Because you're, where? Tell <laughs> <laughs> me when you get on no, vacation. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. And they always say, oh, no, dude, man, enjoy your vacation. What time is it there? I was like, no, it's not a vacation. I can't be on vacation half the year. I got to work, you know. But usually I, I got to the point where I don't even bother to tell people where I am. Right. You know? 
Right. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. They are. They're insistent. No, yeah. go have fun. Call me back when you get. I was like, this is life. This is this is how we do it. Right. I can remember. I get down. I remember having a, a doing client work from Thailand, Cambodia, India, and it's really just a matter of uh, having a good Wi-Fi connection. Um, and the thing I've noticed about. I mean, at least from the the men's dating side with you, Scott, and I I imagine it's the same with um, both sides of the business, but you guys, I've noticed, are really good at taking information and turning that into products. And um, I'd like, maybe you could talk about what that is like to go from identifying, you know, okay, here's something we're good at. Let's see if we can systemize this, put it into a book or an audio or video, and then turning around and selling that to people. Because I know a lot of people, and I tell them, like, I sell information products. They're just like, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't even, they wouldn't, they couldn't fathom that they have a skill that they could immediately turn around, put into some sort of teachable format, and sell it. And I think that's a revolution that you were pointed to earlier, Emily, that the Internet gives us the ability to do. I can teach you. You can teach me. And on the back side of that is this opportunity to travel, have adventure and work while you're not at home. I know. I spoke to a couple of ladies last week, last Tuesday, uh, a couple of friends of mine at, at one of the parks. And, man, she was just a wealth of information. I'm like, could you please write that down? I really need to know that stuff. Mm. I mean, uh, she was this open library. If she can just take that knowledge and transfer it into uh, to information that the rest of us could use, which a lot of us do need, uh, she didn't even realize that. But a lot of people have that skill. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have a lot of people who are like uh, law school graduates or doctors, and they find that their practice is struggling or, uh, you know, they, they get kicked out of a law firm and they don't know what to do or... Uh, you know, they're paying so much in malpractice insurance that they can't even afford to be a doctor anymore. Mm. And they never even think to leverage their alphabet soup behind their name Mm -hmm. and and the credibility they have to go into the info product business. And yet the people who do make hand over fist money out there at it, and and they still get to do what they're passionate about. And on top of that, they don't have to go to an office every day and actually see clients and get rushed to the hospital or you know, deal with courtrooms, they, they can live life on their own. You know, they can enjoy more freedom and still do exactly what it is that they're, they're trained to do, that, that their main core expertise is in. And, you know, you tell people this and they're like, they're, it fries their circuits. Right. They're like, wow, really? Yeah. You know, never even thought of it. I just was scrambling to go find another veterinary job, you know, with right. what I know how to do. Yeah, I think that I think that gets back to the worthiness. You know, I, I remember when I met Stephen. I, I have a, a law degree, uh, so we're sitting here nodding at each other. And you know, I also have a lot of knowledge I've gathered from my own interest about plant based diets and and yoga. And Stephen said, "Oh, you should. Oh, you know, we were talking one day. He said, oh, you should turn that into an info product." And you know, I just I I like couldn't get past. And I think it gets to what you were talking about, Emily, just about you know the way people you know, grow up and see what their lives are supposed to be like. It's so hard to get out of that habitual thinking, mm-hmm. I think. And it's it's just, it's amazing how powerful that can be. Um, I, I wanted to get back to, we were, we were going to ask you about cool digital nomad experiences and what it's like to work around the world. Then you told us that awesome Ethiopia story. Wondering if you have any other kind of examples of, just give people an idea of what your work life actually looks like. Yeah, yeah, that makes it really real. Yeah, I think we're a little different because we're not really fully digital nomads, but we're right. also not s- suburban dwellers who watch it on TV either. We're a little bit of a hybrid. Um, we're man, we are, are on the ragged edge of selling it all and moving <laughs> and getting out of here. Interesting. But we'll talk for about that now, in a minute. So are we? Yeah. <laughs> but for now, we have home base. <laughs> we do have a home base, and you know, I I I like having a home, and we have been traveling about three or four months out of the year. You know, uh, the last year we've traveled a little less because I've been buckling down and doing some of the business stuff. And plus, quite frankly, we crossed off just about everywhere that was burning a hole in our psyche of needing to go there. I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, we're having to get a little creative to to start planning really trips that are really exciting to us. Right. Um, Because we've been doing this since for ages now. Um, the kids, you know, have plenty of places they want to go. So we're, we're, you know, busy juggling that. But 
typically what I think it all comes down to is the freedom of it. We can do what we want to do. Do we want to stay home for a while? Do we want to leave for two or three months this time? Uh, we have not only the opportunity to get on a plane and go somewhere international, but we also have an RV that's pretty nice and we can drag it around and go oh, camping. You know? Nice. So we have all those options because we built all those options into our lives. If I have Wi-Fi, I can work. Um, I, you know, we talked about, you know, it being three o'clock in the morning in Ethiopia. Some places are more convenient to go and do coaching from than others. Um, Asia is interesting because it's exactly 12 hours ahead of New York mm. on the Pacific Rim. So, you know, you can have breakfast and coach somebody last night, you know, right. and, it, right. you know, you've had your night's sleep and they're about to have theirs. And it, it, it's really it works. It works. You know, the, where, where it doesn't work Georgia. is where the you know, <laughs> Republic of Georgia, where it's three o'clock in the morning and it's, you know, eight o'clock in New York. And you have to get up in the morning and do a couple of calls and, you know. Go just back and slam the, an app. You just know. don't drink the beer from the window. <laughs> yeah, don't, just don't drink the unpasteurized weir, beer from the beer window. Oh, yeah. I, I sounded like such a good idea at the time. <laughs> I, I paid for it. I, per, I, I was paying for it precisely the time I had to coach somebody that night. Oh, yeah, man. I looked at the window and uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, Why don't just you guys... Google beer window in Tibelisi, Georgia. Tbilisi, you know exactly. Okay. Real and, quick, um, though, to, you know, be sure but, to but run South down America, some of the places you've been because your list is pretty exotic. You're not kidding when you talk about going to some pretty pretty off-the-beaten-path places. We, we got travel addicted. We're like crack addicts when it came to travel. I mean, my, my bucket list was to do the Traveler Century Club, which is 100 countries. And I thought it was BS to do their 100 territories thing. I actually wanted 100 real countries. Um, and it's funny because now I've been to 110 Emily's been to 105. And uh, I've, I've realized that 12 of them are questionable. So I actually need to go to two more just so <laughs> there's absolutely no question, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, the funny thing is, you know, we, we have been we haven't been to Antarctica. That's that's the one that's really. Mm -hmm. burning yeah. up. But it's tough to take your small children there mm. and Greenland. Greenland, yeah, boy, man, we have this map on our website, on our travel website. Yeah, we've seen that, first, seen that. Yeah, it's just such a huge white hole on there because white is where we haven't been. Oh, and Cuba. And Cuba, we need Cuba, to go to. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you if you're in a coaching business, you can go Central America, South America, and it's not too far off, you know. Right. And uh, you can go to the Pacific Rim, and it's exactly twelve hours off. Even like uh, India is what ten and a half hours. Yeah, but anytime you start getting into it, you'll see some like you'll see that like West Africa and like the Estans are kind of a black hole for us <laughs> on our map. Not because it wouldn't be interesting. Uh they're they're a little exotic to travel to and a little more, you know, they're not the first thing you'd cross off. Right. I think more I think about the more that has to do with what time it is there when it's time to coach people elsewhere. And you have had one week where you had a, a true vacation where there's no phones, no internet, and you remember? Oh, I do. I actually did get to escape. I actually was completely <laughs> off the grid for five days, and that was when we went to North Korea. <laughs> That's what it took. That was my true vacation was going to North, North Korea. North Korea, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you got a nice suntan there. So, yeah, in a roundabout sort of way. <laughs> right. Well, I want to kind of get into uh, on your website you talk about, um, I don't know, 2009, I guess it was, um, you have a two-year-old, you realize you had stopped traveling and kind of both came to a conclusion like, why Why did we stop traveling with kids? Let's talk about the added um, element of children and traveling with them and making a decision to take them on the road with you um, and into places that, by the way, are it's not like uh, you know a road trip to Oklahoma. We're talking about like some serious travel with kids. Yeah, we saw the picture of you with your four-month-old yeah. and at the Taj Mahal, and we just were both like completely <laughs> awestruck, having been to the Taj yeah, Mahal ourselves and remembering what a what a labor that was. In some respects, it looks so beautiful, but there's a lot of effort required. Yes. So I'd love getting to hear to about that, that moment. There's we know what it means to get to that moment, and we all also have had a four-month-old. Our daughter is nine months old, so we're impressed. Oh, yeah, that was definitely, you know, to see the pictures doesn't give it justice. I mean, when you're there and you can smell stuff and yeah. you can have so many of your senses overwhelmed, yes. it's incredible. And you don't even, you, there's nothing that will prepare you for that, but it's just awesome. 
But yeah, we, we took the infant because, you know, she was only four months old, about three and a half months when we left. Uh, she was a nursing baby, so I couldn't just leave her behind because the machine can only do so much. Mm. So, And she was free to fly. So as far as expenses, it wasn't really an added expense. So that was pretty convenient in that in that way. And then, of course, the airliners. Oh, the she airlines, gets first class. <laughs> I know. I wish I got a bed like that. She gets a full, a full, a fl- full flat sleeper. <laughs> in coach. Right, right, she right. sit on the bulkhead. Man, they gave her a little bath. And we went on cutter airways, and they were just so kid friendly. I mean, oh, they yeah. they made her little bed and kept her warm and warmed her bottles. Oh, she didn't have bottles, but you know, they warm. They were they gave her a full package of toys, and she was four months old. I was like, what's this? Oh, yeah, one of them it. gave me a little bag, and it had like baby food and things like that mm-hmm. that they give to all the all the babies. Although she wasn't eating food yeah. at the time, but yeah, it was really interesting. And you had mentioned that your your parents took you traveling when you were a year old, and what some people fail to realize the ch- the children don't really remember this information they don't remember being there and i know sometimes john will go that's not fair i don't remember that's all right but one, one thing we did realize watching sarah and how she interacted with everybody even though she was only three four months old is we could see it had an absolute impact in her personality no question mm. no so question even though she has no memories of it we can see the personality come yeah. out in her just because she had been exposed to so much all the everything that not just it didn't just affect our senses she get to see and smell and Mm -hmm. experience it also even though her brain can't process it at the time and that's right right right. and the other thing i don't know if this was made clear but she didn't have to eat the food so there's no way she was going to get sick off the food right right. and that's huge actually we both oh we know we understand (laughs) (laughs) Um, tell us tell us a little bit more about that how you think it shaped your children to to live some of their a big part of their life on the road i think that could be in many ways you know people also one of the reasons i think people give up their travel dreams is because they think well school 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 we've heard that so many times when we talk about our plans for travel with sophia so in addition to you know, the, how have you done school, I guess? Talk a little bit about what, what the experience is like raising your children with that kind of travel in their lives. Well, John was getting ready to go into school, and so we tried taking advantage of travel as much as we could before he went to school. We went to Fiji, we took him to Europe, and of course that coming September he had to start school. So he went to school, and we're like, huh, there's this letdown, like, now what? Right. right. Now we're stuck here for the next nine months before we can take out of here again. And uh, so we did that for a year and a half because he went through kindergarten and half of first grade. But the school system and him wasn't a good match. And so I started doing some research of what some alternatives out there were. And one of them was homeschool. And it's not just homeschool. There's actually a, a trillion different options to homeschooling styles. So it's a matter of finding one that fits him, that he's able to learn and grow as a person, both intellectually as well as emotionally. So it's been wonderful for the whole family. So now we have the, the freedom of him learning at his pace and at his own style. But also, since we're the teacher, we get to decide when we're in school and when we're not. And we travel the world and let the school, I'm sorry, we let the world be his school playground. Well, when we discovered that there was a world schooling Right. mindset and a community to match. I mean, we were we were like the little dancing bee girl. You know, <laughs> the old Blind Melon video, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. about no rain. Like we found our little dancing bees in the meadow to go like gallivant with. Um, you know, a couple of things are to kind of fill in a couple of gaps. Uh, we got pretty creative about going on trips in the summer with the RV and taking the kids, you know, during Christmas break and stuff. Um, but really the trips that we took with our son and our daughter in particular before um, Junior went to um, went to public school really sort of spoiled him for public school. He was he was worldly. He was he had gone on more adventures than any of the teachers in that whole school. Yeah. You know, we had taken them in the trailer to nearly every national park you had heard of in the entire United States already. Right. And when the teacher uh, wanted to talk about a certain country, you know, uh, he was more than willing to take over the conversation. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he was like, you know, you people are boring, you know, and he, and he was also, I mean, in fairness to him, he, he passed the G&T test and very few kids in his class did. So he was very bored. And then, you know, we added it all up and it was time to take him out of school. I and mean, he was acting up and really all he was doing was being a boy. 
And then, of course, you know, it was off to the races after we decided we were going to do the homeschooling, world schooling thing. And, you know, we've taken them on wonderful adventures in the in the RV. Uh, Emily said we took them to Fiji. We took them on a road trip all around Europe mm. uh, and then got on a plane and flew some other places. I mean, we and we take them places with history and we don't just take them like to the Eiffel Tower and, and places like that. I mean, we took our kids to Northern Ireland and let them see where all the troubles took place. Um, we've taken them, you know, we like taking them to parts of the world that aren't necessarily dangerous, but let them see for themselves what the people are like and what the culture is like instead of, you know, believing what CNN tells them. Right. So, you know, we've taken them to very Muslim countries. We've taken them to Kuwait and to Jordan. And, um, you know, they've been to, uh, like I said, Ethiopia. And they went on the whole trip to the northern Ethiopia. Our kids, uh, our, our kids respect other kids from other cultures. Uh, the color of someone else's skin doesn't phase them a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, they'll try amazing food. And they'll they'll just they'll eat anything, and they want these adventures. And you know, we took them to Turkey and spent some time there. Mm -hmm. And the, Turkey, if you know, is one of the most kid friendly nations on earth. Wow, cool! And of course, people are like, how can you take your kids to Turkey? They blew up the airport in Istanbul three or four months ago. It's like, well, how can you live in the United States? Somebody shot somebody in Chicago too. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and we don't ever have any trouble. Everybody's really very very sweet. Um, people are very down to earth and, you know, we, we struggle with getting sick here and there and it doesn't make the trip better, but, you know, we deal with that when we come up. And I think that's just the, the nature of not staying at home in your little bubble. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get to experience, you know, people being so kind and going out of the way to make us feel comfortable. Uh, when Sarah got sick in Jordan, people mm. really went out of the way and were very concerned and checked up on us and everything. It was just yeah. very heartwarming and very touching. And, you know, and she's not like deathly ill. She just doesn't feel well. Sure. Know? Making us tea and stuff. I know. Very sweet. Very sweet. I, mean, the, the, I can't say enough about the Arab world and how, how kind the people are mm -hmm. and how hospitable. And I mean, you know, it's funny because, you know, we're, we're as we're recording this, it's February 2017. And I mean, things just change. They seesaw so back and forth in terms of political correctness and everything in the United States. I mean, five months ago, Muslim people were the worst people on earth. And now Donald Trump gets elected and wants to keep some Muslims out. And, of course, everybody's Muslims are these great, sweet people. How can we oppress them like this? It's like, God, what a pivot. You know, and, of course, and then there's the truth. <laughs> you know, the truth, you know, you go meet these people and you see what their culture's like and you see the good and the bad and you can weigh it for yourself, you know. And I think that's so amazing to be able to take your kids and, not to show them a video, but to, to meet the people and eat the food and smell the air and experience the adventures and play with the kids, you know? And and this may sound this may be a bit rudimentary, but when you're do when you're on the road like that, are you doing other kind of schooling in the process? I know that some world schoolers they do uh, a curriculum they have they're teaching math and science or whatever or is this purely experiential learning cultural learning if you will well for the moment because we have a home base and we're only out on the road two or three months out of the year uh when we're actually on the road this is purely experiential yeah uh, we do a lot of reading so we still do a little bit this and that and when we're actually like in ethiopia we went on a tour and we're in one of the uh monasteries and we're learning about uh what the different pictures mean and the history there really that's a field trip that's still oh, yeah, school it's a big field that's trip. amazing that's but amazing. we're not doing the formal math the formal reading you right. know the formal history but we're actually on a full-fledged gigantic field trip and for example we went to greece not too long ago and we got home and now when we're home we have the full entire uh curriculum for for learning and in what I've included is the places that we've been to and review it. And we're learning about history, about Greece and ancient history. And the kids are just eating it up because they've been there. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine and I remember being in school. And the one thing we, we, I would always ask, why are we studying this? It has nothing to do with me. It makes no sense to me. Right. Right. 
But if it's done, if you've done it personally, it becomes important to you. You become interested. And since they've been there, they're interested. Well, I mean, I'm going to add this to that. When we're home, they have curriculum. They have, you know, interactions with other kids and there's a lot of math and science and, you know, they do cool little experiments and, and they go above and beyond what those kids are going to learn in school. No doubt. The, the trips... When we take them on trips, even out west or, you know, in the camper or, or even when we get on airplanes and fly, we don't really make it like it's a, a, a classroom experience. And this is going to be like a, a big, you know, we're going to have to have our school time every day from X hour to X hour. And there's a quiz afterwards. Yeah. And then <laughs> that's it. You know, and I had a couple cross-cultural trips for credit when I was in college, and it's rather like that. You take them places and you look for the teachable moments and everything is a big teachable moment. But one thing I've noticed is that they're going to experience a certain place differently than we do. Yeah. You know, yeah. Adults will experience it differently than a five-year-old or an eight-year-old. I mean, sometimes Sarah or John will, will point out something and talk about it and ask a question that really challenges us because we're like, you know, we never looked at it that way. And, um, you know, little things that come up, like they have these things called kinder eggs over there. And it turns yeah. out they fan them in the United States. And what they are, they're little chocolate Easter eggs. And inside is like one of those plastic bubbles with a little toy in it. And I mean, you know, you use Kinder eggs as a reward for learning things and being able to, you know, and for paying attention, you know. And, you know, they, they know they're not going to get Kinder eggs back in the States. And so, you know, there's little things that just become little cultural pieces of fun that you can incorporate. But, you know, we go places that, and we meet the people and we, we do see the sites and we do have the adventures and we do break it down and we do look for all the things that are, are going to matter from an educational perspective while we're there. I mean, Emily mentioned, you know, learning about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian history. But, you know, you know, you, go, you look at other places like obviously Greece is just replete with opportunities to talk about what happened right here. I said, you know, right where you're standing right now, you know what happened? And we tell them, they're like, wow, right where we're standing. And, you know, sometimes it seems like they don't care. And then sometimes it seems like they care about something else when they should be caring about what you wish they cared about. But then you get home and you see that, you know, they drink it all in. Like you can be watching the Olympics in Rio with your son. And he goes, hey, look, there's that thing from that place. And that's when we did that. And, and you know, they, it soaked in. They remembered it because... You know, it's the old adage, how much do you remember of what you hear? Well, what you say, you hear more. When you experience it, you remember almost everything. Right. So, yeah, yeah, it's it a big field trip, but it's, you know, we mix things in. Yeah, it goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, sitting in your own home and looking around and barely being able to remember a handful of things that matter that happened there. Whereas on the road, just a, a bounty of memories comes up, you know, uh, in terms of what happened there. And it's clearly the same for kids. Because oh. your life is so rich and so vibrant. And yes. it makes sense. Things You're stand out. You're not just out. doing the same thing over and over <laughs> right. and over and over again. And so you guys have talked so much about and so eloquently about the benefits and the beauties of, of travel with children. Can you Have you ever thought about living in another country? I'm sure you've thought about it. <laughs> and uh, if so, just this morning. where? <laughs> well, I, I want to say one more thing about the kids and, and sure. whether you're taking them on a trip that's you know, a couple of weeks or whether you're actually moving there with them. One thing we've really noticed is that they complain less, they withstand more. And, you know, you can string a 40 hours of flying in a row. You can have to run through an airport. You can get rained on. You can have to go some time without food. You can be holed up in an airport overnight because you missed the flight. The hotel can be all wrong. You can, you can come up with the challenges associated with adventure travel. And it's like your kids, they start living for it. They love it. They don't complain. They're like, oh, cool. You know, here's another little puzzle to figure out. You know, if you're the kind of person who likes that, and I think anybody who's an adventurer travel is. Definitely. It's amazing how your kids, they're like, well, this is, this is how it's supposed to be. It's almost like, you know, you grow up in your family thinking whatever your family life is, is normal. Well, this is, this is normal. We go on adventures and we have to figure out the flights and, you know, there's long train rides and, you know, there's crazy things that happen and poverty and weird food. And either you eat this or you starve and it's like, all right. And, and it's funny how adaptable 
they are and how much they really like it. I mean, they're like, hey, can we do that again after it was miserable? And you're like, wow, did that just come out of my kid's mouth? <laughs> and what a great way to prepare them for the real world when they're <laughs> yeah, adults. So you bet. They're not going to be whiners. And and yet they come back home and then two weeks later, you they're know, whining. they're <laughs> laying around on their Xbox and whining about things. And it's like they fall back into middle class America. Mm. You know, it, it, I did want to say it, but, you know, living in another country, you know, you, you want to make sure you choose well. And I think you also want to make sure that you're light on your feet. I don't think we're going to decide to go settle somewhere. But, I mean, on, on top of our list, I mean, the kids want to go to Japan really badly. So, you know, East Asia is a, a place where we want to take our kids and, and let them see a lot. Mm -hmm. um, South America is another place. I mean, we fell in love with Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. You know, and and some places, you know, even down on the South American continent, uh, Peru, Argentina, those places are amazing. We want to take our kids to Chile and Paraguay and Bolivia. And they're, they're already begging for safaris, but they're going to have to wait yeah, another 10 wait years. I think I think we need to wait a little bit before we do safaris. But, you know, we keep threatening to pick up the stakes and move to East Africa. Oh, yes. We, we want to we want to. Um, solidify a stake in a in a safari company at some point oh, cool. you know which we, we, we've been talking about for a while and might be happening here soon but you know what you can't really take it, it's not a, it's not the wisest thing you have to make wise decisions still you know you don't take kids to war zones and you sure. don't take them where they could get eaten by a lion at night and you know you've got to okay. use some jurisprudence on this stuff but i mean what's on you your know. what would be on your list in east africa Tanzania, Kenya, any cities in there? Major cities, I guess. We would love to live in Kenya. Oh yes. <laughs> we just we fell in love with Kenya. It's just absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we'd live in Nairobi, but certainly mm -hmm. southwest out towards the lake. You know, um, probably around Nakuru. You know, Kisi was a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's gorgeous. A I S I I. The, the big, huge cypress trees and the hills. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. And it, that's kind of the gateway to the Maasai Mara from that direction. Right. Right. South Africa is gorgeous. Um, and, and, you know, everybody who's world schoolers always, the world schoolers always rave about Bali. We, and, we took our honeymoon in Bali and loved it. Yeah. Yeah. They say it's a great place to stay a while with some kids. So that's probably near the top of our list also. Yeah. Also been to South Africa and, and definitely have thought about going back for a longer period, possibly to live there after I was there as well. It's, it's cheaper than you think. Yeah. South Africa. Well, you know, one thing that is coming up for me, and then I, I have a few final questions to ask you guys, but, and you alluded to this before when you talked about CNN, and, you know, there's a, there's a pretty large gap between the reality of quote unquote safety and peace in these countries versus what we're shown here through the media. And we've experienced that directly in various ways in our own travels, but I'd love to hear from you guys talking about. You know, that gap, the space between what it's really like in a place like Colombia, for example, or Nicaragua or um, Georgia, I know, or any of the stands versus what we're taught to fear here. Right. That's an excellent question. And I have a son. We took him to Europe when he was 15. And uh, my ex-husband and the family on that side were all scared because at the time we, we took him to Greece. And Greece was having their issues there, and there was protests uh, there at the main square. And <laughs> they were like, stay away from there. And so he was worried. And my husband and I kept telling him, look, the reality of what's been broadcast on the news and from our <laughs> personal experience everywhere we've gone, you know, it's going to be different when we get there. Just relax. It'd be cool. You know, we know what to do. You go in there slowly. Everything's fine. You progress or you, you proceed. Yeah. And uh, when we got there, it was what? Just a handful of people? <laughs> Wait, well, you know, there's, the, there's that square and uh, where the parliament building is, you know, in Athens. Right. And, and we ended up walking around the turn, you know, from, you know, from where the placa is. And we're there. We're in it. And and we don't even realize it at first. We just think it's like a crowd of people standing around. But then we realize they're hanging banners. They're they're all you know, Peaceful. drinking mythos beer and stuff together. And we're like, oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And then we get across the other side and we say to David, well, that's everything that your grandfather was really afraid of. He's like, that was, like, that? was <laughs> it. Like, like uh, yeah, that's usually how it goes. <laughs> so 
and you know, we've gone through quite a few countries and we've, you know, we've experienced this how many times now? Did we bother to tell his his grandparents that we were taking him to Bosnia? I think we just left that out. We left that out. Yeah, they were already having a heart attack as it was. <laughs> right. Goodness. And then Colombia, you hear all these horror stories about Colombia and we went there. That place is just gorgeous. Well, we ended up having coffee <laughs> with at the with the Escobars at Pablo's house. In the, <laughs> I mean, everybody's like afraid of the Escobars, which is why they won't go there. We went to his house and had had coffee with him. Wow. Yeah. And we're still here. Yeah, yeah, and you're so still real. here. Well, my yeah. first my first major international trip was in 1988 to Moscow. Oh and, yeah, cool. That went in '86. Ah, you got me by a. Two no, years. no, same thing, same thing. But yes. it was, but it was just sort of like there was. Uh, so much fear, trepidate. Oh, you shouldn't go. Are you sure he? Are you sure he's going to go? Is that a, is that a good idea? And we got there, and it was great. And in fact, they were way more interested in us than we were in them, because mm-hmm. as you remember, very few Westerners were there. They hadn't seen blue jeans, many of them before. Oh, I remember the blue jean negotiations. I, I, yeah, and, and the hockey, <laughs> hockey jerseys, flags. Military garb, the whole deal. Anyway, but it's it's true. There's this massive gap. We're preached fear on this side, but the truth is, when you go to these places, as you've seen, um, it by and large does not exist. Teresa and I were actually the other night just kind of looking at the World Peace Index, and I don't even know who puts that together. But <laughs> but the United States is far more dangerous than virtually every country we've talked about on this podcast yeah. so far. I mean, it's like 103rd out of 150 or something. Yeah. There, are, there are a lot safer places than living. And then in there's the a lot of variation in there, you know. Well, yeah, I, I, true. I want to say something about Moscow back in the 80s because I, I'd be remiss if I didn't drop this because you were talking so closely about it. I, I was talking to kids my own age over there, and I remember they spoke wonderful English, and I didn't know any Russian. <laughs> and and that alone got me. And then wow. one of them finally said, because we were talking about politics, you know, they'd warned me, don't talk about politics. But I mean, I don't know. I was a kid, you know, and they were too, and they wanted to know. And I remember this kid, it sounded almost like a Mel Brooks line from one of his movies. He was like, bombs, nuclear weapons. You're worried about us? Think about us. You've actually used them before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Man, it rocked me back on my feet. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. We have. We're the ones who've actually used them on people before. They never used them on anybody. Right. And I mean, you just never even think like that. You just never even stop and think, you know, because they're, you know, they're the big red bear. They're the, they're the enemy. They're the problem, right. you know? Right. So yeah. you guys have been carving your own path. And that's a lot about what we're interested in on this podcast is kind of drilling into how people do that to show other people how they can too. it. Do you guys think, you know, is there a belief or set of beliefs that that you guys have um, that pull you towards your own true north that you feel a sense of, you know, joy or excitement and you follow that rather than simply doing what everyone else does? Can you can you talk about that or break that down for our audience? No north, only south. <laughs> I like the cold. Perfect. Keep it warm, baby. Keep it warm. That's our north. It's heading south. <laughs> <It's too> south. <laughs> Just t- have you ever seen that video? The guy who th- shows you how like maps and globes really should look, and at the end he goes, "And how about this?" And he flips the world completely over. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, because it's really arbitrary what's totally. north. Totally. Right, of course. Um, well, all right. Look, I, here's. I'll tell you where we're struggling right now. I mean, struggle is a good thing in our in this case. Is you know how how attached am I really to my pickup truck that I love so much and my mm. my vintage BMX bike collection? It, we're a little bit of a pack rat, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> do I really care? You know, do I really care? I mean, or am I am I going to sit here at this desk for the next ten years? I, I mean, we've been living in this house for ten years and we don't change the furniture much. I mean, we leave and we have adventures and we're we're living a different life than everybody else. But instead of just saying, hey, you know, we outdistance ourselves from everyone else, say, hey, let's stop comparing. What do we want? You know, and, you know, the question is, do we have the guts to go do what we want? I mean, you know, with the whole idea that it's, you know, what's best for the kids has to enter into it also. And you're talking about the safety and the security. And we couldn't believe, you know, we couldn't agree with you more that. Just about every country you can think of is a lot safer when you get there and a lot less fraught with danger than we even think. 
But, you know, you still have to, there's a lot to consider. And I think that's where we are, is we're considering all those things and saying, what is it that we really want and, and what makes sense? Yeah, traveling wisely. But I think part of what drives us also is, what do we really want? In other words, when we are on our deathbed, do we, will we feel we've accomplished what we really set out to do? Um, are we going to live with any regrets? And as long as I'm comfortable going, you know, I could actually leave this earth fully satisfied because I've done something good for myself, for my family, for my friends, and for everybody else who's been in my life. And I've built memories. Other people have built memories. And if I can say yes, then that was the right thing to do. And so we kind of run our lives in that, in that direction that mm -hmm. we want to make sure we leave this world fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. By the way, real quick, what's, uh, if, if you were to look at your bucket list, what are the next one or two things on that list for either of you? Let's go, let's go, let's go back and forth. You name one, I'll name one. Mine's Antarctica. Got it. Okay. Oh, you stole mine. No, I, I mean, that's <laughs> why you went first. That's why you went first. Cuba. Well, is it going to be all places or is it things we want to do? Oh, see, with things we want to do, um, I'd like to do uh, the, fl no, I don't want to do skydiving. I would like to do like the indoor diving. Indoor well, we're going to do that next week. That doesn't count. It doesn't count. I'm still doing it. It does count. <laughs> it's on the list. It's going to get crossed off. That's right. <laughs> I would like to be able to live nomadically. That's something we're working on. Right. Nice. Cool. Um, I, I mean, all the places we want to go are one thing. The adventures we want to have are completely other things. Yeah. Um, you know, I have airplane types I want to fly yet. I have airlines I want to fly on. I, I, I want to go down to Namibia and go hunting with the people, with, with the Bushmen who speak the click language. Yeah, cool. I, I want to go hunting with those guys because you can do that. Um, I, I, next thing on my bucket list is my, my son and I have become amateur herpetologists which sounds like we like getting herpes, but that's not what it means. It's about snakes and lizards. And, I, and we're planning a trip to go out west with our snake, skits, snake sticks like Dominic Monaghan, you know, and, and right. just wrangling snakes. That's next on my bucket list is the snake wrangling safari. That's definitely in there. Which they've discovered they loved. Uh, we took them to, uh, yeah. to an event last week where they had all kinds of reptiles that they got to hold and get really close to. And Ooh, Sarah had to give up one of the uh, corn snakes. And she's like, but I love her. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have love said it. we also want to go to Greece and directly assist with the Syrian refugee situation. Yes, That's absolutely. Our volunteer life. work. I think that would be incredible. This and is, have the kids volunteer. It's yeah. so cool, though, because people who travel and do things tend to have very interesting responses to a question like that. Whereas... A lot of people would be like, oh, I, 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 I want to go to the Dominican Republic on vacation. <laughs> right. I was going to go to the Labadee Beach with uh, Royal Caribbean. Yeah. Yes, I was curious if you guys even had anything left or if you just rewrite your bucket lists or do you, I mean, do you rewrite your bucket list? We always add to it. Yeah. yeah my, this is huge. I'm just drawing a blank on a lot of them right now, but there are things that, that are on there that are, that are really interesting. I mean, we've gone places. Water caves. Oh, yeah, we want to do ice caves and we want to do the water caves. You, but things like, you know, climbing a glacier with clamp-ons and yeah, cool. doing uh, the, the, the plank road in the sky at, at Huashan National Park. Yes, in China. In, in China yeah, and yeah. doing the, uh, uh, the devil's swimming pool at, like, at, at Victoria Falls. You know, I, these are things that I see on YouTube and I'm ruined until I get to do them. So, you yeah. know, we... The, the Trans-Siberian Railway we, was one of them that we really wanted to do. Herding yaks on horseback in Mongolia and, you know, the safari things and seeing the big five and going shark cage diving was on there. Uh, going to the wine country in Georgia was on there. Um, flying Russian-made airplanes was on there, which I got to do in 86, but... Yeah, I hope you did too. Did you get to fly some Russian aircraft to get there? Well, we f we flew Aeroflot from nice, uh, yes, and that yeah. was something. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and distinctly back. remember getting off the airplane and into the Moscow airport and just being stunned at the smell, the aroma of Russia, <laughs> and it it persisted. It's kind of like India. When you get to India, it smells yeah. like burning trash wherever you go. In Russia, <laughs> in the late eighties, it was like this kind of prevalent bo scent everywhere yeah it's kind of hard to describe it's like it's, it's like when you unique. go to mexico and every restaurant smells like fabuloso 
<laughs> use of their cleaning fluid. And you never know what it is. The one day you know what it is. Right, right, right. right, you're, right. Sometimes you're not happy you knew what it is. But oh yeah, man, that was just a big thrill to fly this Russian. Meat. You felt like you were just infiltrating. It was just amazing. It was pretty. Um, but anyway, things like that, you know, um, wanted we wanted to go above the Arctic Circle. We wanted to see the Northern Lights. We wanted to see moose in the wild. I mean, I could just go geographically. Iceland, you know, we wanted to go walk behind a waterfall. Right. Oh, cool. All, all those things in India, we had a bunch of them. You know, uh, Nepal. You know, we wanted to climb the Himalaya. Um, yeah, we know. were going to go trekking, and then Stephen got sick. For about <laughs> ah, yours is a junior. Days. Days. Still on the list. <laughs> Still on the list. Well, but you know, the adventures are fun, and you, you know, you don't just. I mean, there's some people out there who like collect countries. You know, they're trying to go to as many countries in the world as they can. So, I mean, they go to China, Beijing for a layover and then never go to China again. Yeah. I, I'm all about the adventures. Me I mean, too. I just think there's Me amazing too. things. I, I don't, I think it's fine if you want to track how many countries you've been to, but go to the country. Don't just be there because you're checking a box. Oh yeah. I mean, we went to, last time we went to Japan, the bucket list items were, you know, take the bullet train from Osaka to, uh, to Tokyo, go see the Yomiuri giants play baseball. Oh, cool. That's uh, go one. to sumo, you know, yeah, that's and, a cool one. You know, all of those were, were crossed off. You know, we made sure we did all of them. Yeah. I, back when I went to Japan, I was quite the theater geek. And I went to see mm. no theater, kabuki, bunraku puppets, oh, yeah. and it just blew my mind. It was some of the yeah. most amazing things I've ever seen. Um, go ahead, So Teresa. we have some, we, we know we need to wrap up. So we have some final okay. questions. <laughs> we could keep talking to you guys about travel experiences forever, I'm sure. But um, we have a few final questions that we've been asking all of our guests. Um, so we'll just kind of go, um, it's just three questions. Um, so for both of you, what book or books, up to three, would you recommend that every human being should read? Am I going to go first? You can go first. Um, well, you know, we always talk about uh, uh, Travel as a Political Act by Rick Steves, which I think is a great book. Oh, that's cool. Um, I think Scott Adams' book on religion is amazing. Hmm. I forget the name of it. And I would recommend everybody read a, 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 a biography of, about David Livingston, especially in today's day and age. Hmm. Because he was a British guy who went to Africa um, – to fight against slavery mm -hmm. back in 1850. Wow, yeah. And, uh, and he was instrumental in opening up Africa to, to Europeans, but he did it in a, in a very philanthropic way. He wasn't just a, a, you know, a scorched earth kind of guy. He didn't do everything perfectly, but I think he was way ahead of his time, not only in in, in his, his view towards human rights and racial equality, but he was also a connector, which I find fascinating. Like he would, he would meet people from different cultures and say, you ought to go meet those guys. They're pretty cool. And so he was like a, he, he made peace where there weren't even connections yet. And, you know, there's always, uh, he, he, he comes under fire for how, you know, poor a leader he was sometimes. And he put people in harm's way without even realizing it. But, None of us are perfect. And I just think it was really cool, not only that he had that mindset, but my God, he went on such amazing adventures. You know what I mean? I mean, stuff that we would consider today he was doing before anybody ever even knew what was out there. And I always admire that. Yeah, that's cool. What about you, Emily? Well, I, I Scott mentioned the one that I really loved was, uh, you know, travel is a political political statement because political act. a political act. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Travel is a political act because he, he did such a great job. And I noticed that people either love it or they hate it. And mm -hmm. those who love it are those who have actually traveled and have had caught a glimpse of the differences in, in cultures and stuff and the viewpoints for that matter. And he does it with such humor <laughs> that you can't help but giggle and laugh. I, I had a lot of fun reading that book. Speaking mm -hmm. of giggle and laugh, anything by David Barry is wonderful reading for a 14-hour flight. Oh, well, wow. that's the good. Political, right. yeah, the political humor is, my gosh, he's funny. He is so damn funny. Yeah, anything by David Barry. Hey, David Barry actually has a travel book, which, I, I mean, I, I was disrupting an entire 777 one night, laughing my ass off reading this book. I just had to finally put it away. Sorry, y'all. Go back to sleep. You know, <laughs> it's just it's laugh out loud funny. Yeah. Um, let's just go ahead and throw the cat out of the bag. Emily's dyslexic, so she usually. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> doesn't read like full on novels. So maybe that's why she's drawn a little bit of a blank. Well, there. she can probably answer the second question that yeah. we have then, which is, and maybe we can, this question is basically what's the best meal you've ever had, oh. but maybe you could answer that in terms of travel and, and, or if it's something else comes to mind other than IHOP on your first date, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Best meal oh I've goodness. ever had. Okay, wow. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go give I'm gonna do a lightning round on these. All right, because I I don't want to talk about Michelin star restaurants and everything. I just want to talk about what tastes amazing. Yeah, you are never going to get better than the beef in Argentina. Mm, mm. That's if you're a carnivore yeah. man, you just go to Argentina and eat. And the only reason. And, and I mean, that's after we've been to barbecue in um, over in Lockhart, Texas. Okay, which you know, these cows never thought they tasted so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it's amazing there. I would add lobster in Maine. Uh, mm. Kaiten wow. sushi in Tokyo. Yeah, which yeah, is the yeah. sushi on the belt that you stack the plates. I've plate. had that. Yeah, I've had that. That's good. anything Georgian cuisine. Georgian cuisine uh, is incredibly underrated. Those dumplings. Oh, Interesting. Talk about the dumplings. Um, getting uh, going to Greece off the beaten track and, and eating gyros made in made in Greece is just, just absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, now we make Indian food here. Yeah, we were inspired it, to make cook Indian food after we went to India. Yeah, no Indian doubt. food over there is amazing. You've been there, so you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. And even our guide told us that her friends and family, when they come to visit, they just devour the food there. She's like, "But well, you're a, you know, you can make it there." That they like. We just can't make it the same. The no, spices just aren't close. the same here. Yeah. Shirawat in Ethiopia. Um, ceviche in Peru. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just... I'm hungry. Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> we need ceviche. Especially ceviche. Uh, and, and go, to, go to a brewery's restaurant in Germany. Like, go to the Hacher Shore restaurant where they make the food to go with their beer. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And go to like the Hunt, the Hinchtefaner's restaurant and eat the German food there. Oh, yes. oh my gosh! You just you have to that push, was push back. Oh, I know. Oh. Uh, Riga Latvia, you told me was a great restaurant. Oh my gosh, the food in Riga Latvia. Every, I mean, just it's like your mom, your grandmother has personally cooked food for you. Well, no, yeah. there's that also that restaurant right on the square in Tallinn. Yes. Estonia. That's that, right. I, I mean, there, there is love baked into lunch there. I mean, you can taste the love baked in. I mean, it's just, oh my gosh, it's so absolutely. Well, the Baltics make such amazing food. One thing we found was that, you know, we lived in New York for a long time and, and, and you could have virtually any cuisine there, you know, that you, I mean, there was an Ethiopian restaurant in Brooklyn, for example, which we went yeah. to. Wonderful. But the difference between that and the food in the country. For example, Thai food. Although in Thailand, much of the oh, most yeah. of the forward-facing <laughs> culture is designed for backpackers and yeah. uh, all that. But if you can kind of get behind that, the food is phenomenal. We had curry that in, in India as well. That just yeah. I had never knew there was that kind of flavor involved mm-hmm. in the food. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it's actually very spicy. I I can eat very spicy food. I'm always very disappointed in the spicy food here. Not in India or Thailand. They don't. Mess and, up. and regionally in India, it's different. The Punjabi food's different than what you'll have in Mumbai. Mm. Yeah, uh, or, or I agree. South Been India. A, Ooh, and so the China, the food in China, Chinese food, is very different than American Chinese food. Oh and yeah. I love I love the Beijing style, and I love the Sichuan food. You know, oh, the, just want to kill you. Oh my God, they got that spice that that's like menthol hot, hot pepper and menthol mixed together. You can't even find that. You know, wow. Yeah, so one last question: <laughs> What have you learned in the last thirty days that you think every person should know? That the front hubs on Ford F one fifty pickup trucks are a weak link, and you should make sure that you go hammer the dealership when they finally break. <laughs> Actually, you know, that's pretty apropos because I've been thinking about a Ford F-150. <laughs> well, mine's, yeah, I have this beloved truck that I've been driving for seven years because it's a rare color, but stuff's starting to break. So, <laughs> Were you looking for something less esoteric? I can probably give you something a little more philosophical. Enlighten us, Scott. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've learned that there are a lot of really great coaches out there who teach something very different than me, and I should definitely align myself with them. And co-brand ourselves and, and change the world together instead mm. of just talking about each other. Mm. Nice. 
Right. I've also learned that if I just ask really amazing people to be on my podcast, it's amazing how often they actually say yes. Good point. Very good point. I'm warming up now, so I'll let Emily take it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. What have I learned uh, within the last 30 days? I'm always learning something because I'm always reading all kinds, all kinds of articles here and there. Uh, oh, and that the Spurs need a new power forward. <laughs> anyway, um, just staying busy with the, with the business and how I have a huge impact uh, makes a difference. Uh, staying busy with the children and learning different lifestyles or not lifestyles, but learning styles. Uh, learning about dyslexia and how it affects your ability to to read and and uh, how you learn differently, but you're still you know everyone has a different learning style and how being alert to that when it comes to children is important. Mm. So I've, I've learned a lot lately, especially with learning about these little tiny, not exactly disabilities, but just, I call it different learning styles. Yeah, 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 definitely. PVC um, plumbing fittings. Yeah. We learned. Oh, gosh, goodness. I've been doing lots of home repair lately. She loves it. <laughs> I don't even have to man up. Uh, I've learned about <laughs> cabinetry. I've taken the guts out. We're about ready to do, uh, about ready to do some uh, roofing repairs up there next. Yeah. Nice. So I've done a lot of reading and research on just being in the handy woman. <laughs> We're pretty normal people when we get right down to it. <laughs> well, before we let you go, why don't you guys talk a little bit about kind of where people can find you online, your businesses, and uh, maybe what's coming up with your work. Uh, what should people know about you and how can they uh, connect with you online? Well, I think for the dating advice and relationship advice stuff, check out the show that you guys are going to be on, which is X and Y on the Fly. That was the show that we originally started back in 06, and uh, we're firing it back up again. Uh, guys out there, I also do another show called The Mountaintop, um, formerly known as The Chick Whisperer. And Mountaintop is more in keeping with the times. All this travel and adventure that we've been talking about, go to uh, wingitworldwide.com is where you're drawing all these wonderful stories from. Um, and uh, anytime you go to one of our sites uh, for the show notes pages for the podcast in particular, go ahead and click the, the talk to us for 25 minutes uh, button at the top right, and we, um, which sees what you get. We'd love to talk to you. And if you uh, uh, want to do, get some coaching or, or become better at some of the things that we've talked about. We're here for you and we're really down to earth. We're easy to work with. Nice. Very nice. Well, um, thank you to you both. Very generous and we love your energy. How, oh, totally. How, it sounds we're like you inspired. guys are, are, are having a lot of fun together. And I know yeah. that listening to this, it's, it's been a lot of fun too. We really, really appreciate it. Well, our relationship is never work. I know that a lot of times people say that, but I think when you find the right person and you get each other, I think every day is, is an adventure in itself. In a good way. And I never get tired working with him. I like working with him because I just like him. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. All right. That's it for this week's On Stream podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed our awesome conversation with Scott and Emily McKay. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode for links to everything we mentioned including all the books we talked about, their websites, social media profiles, and more. All of that can be found at ownstream.co backslash McKay. That's ownstream.co backslash M-C-K-A-Y. Also, before we let you go, please sign up for our weekly tip-off email at ownstream.co and just click the sign up button in the upper right-hand corner. This is where we share each Monday three cool things we've learned in the last week in the areas of lifestyle, business, and spirit. This could be an amazing quote, an individual, a tip, or a tool designed to bring you more freedom and power in your life. So definitely sign up for that again at ownstream.co and just click sign up in the upper right-hand corner. Finally, follow us on Twitter at ownstream and on Instagram where we post regularly at own underscore stream. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the OwnStream podcast. To learn more and connect with us, please visit ownstream.co or follow us on Twitter at OwnStream and Instagram at own underscore stream. Stream.